Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Uh, hmm. Ah. Ah, I gotta wake up. Brief history of UK, great cram. Brief history of Ukraine. General knowledge, bam to like, original link to the video, top of the description. I hope you all are doing well. Phone's away. I toss it already, throw it. Uh, link to the Discord below the original link to the video, like always. Let's... Let's go. I really want to know that. Why was China divided before World War II? Uh, let's go. Ukraine. A place that, if you weren't familiar with, you are now, for the worst reasons. It's important to start by letting you know that- Ooh, nice globe. This video isn't about what's going on in Ukraine right now. There's enough sources of content for that and far better informed than a video here could be. But this I always get the Volga. Since everyone is talking about Ukraine right now, Dnieper. I thought it would be important to learn more about the country. More specifically, it is the Dnieper. It's the Dnieper, Dnieper. Volga, I think, is right there. About its history. Does the Vol so the Volga enters the uh, Caspian. I always get so sad whenever I see the Caspian Sea, because if only it was connected somehow to the Black Sea or the Persian Gulf, it could be such a useful, I'm sure it is still a useful but, uh, thing, but I, I just wonder, like, the trade routes in the Caspian throughout history, what, what they must have been. So in this video, we're going to try to summarize the key points of Ukrainian history, dividing it into very short segments that allow us to get the key ideas of every time period since its beginning up to today. Human settled in Ukraine almost 50,000 years ago and by 4500 BC the Kukuteni Tripilia culture is said to have been flourishing in the area. It's considered one of the most likely locations where the domestication of uh is it is that part of the urn culture? Like there there's an urn something culture in Europe where it's it's identified as the urn something because of they would use urns I, I don't nah. of horses by humans took place during the iron age it was inhabited by many people of the surrounding regions cimmerians scythians and sarmatians but it was the scythians who initially took greater control of the territory with it being part of the scythian kingdom between 700 and 200 bc also during this time greek roman and byzantine colonies were established there on the coast of the black sea byzantine time greek roman and byzantine colony byzantine is am i am i missing a uh, byzantine i thought byzantines weren't a thing for another 600 years or were they the byzantines am i missing something were the byzantines a name of people before were established there on the coast of the Black Sea. The most well-known ones were Tias, Olbia, Cherzonesus, among others. But these were just colonies, and the people who settled there varied a lot, from the three we saw earlier to others, like the Goths, the Huns, the Old Bulgarians. In fact, Old Bulgaria was local. Someone told me that the, yeah, Byzantine, OC 650. Someone told me that Crimea is sort of like an arid area. Is that, I, I, I can't see how that would be true. Located there. Then they migrated elsewhere and the Khazars took over the land along with the Antis. And so we can conclude that since very early on, the lands where Ukraine now is were the home of many peoples and tribes. By this point, we begin to get closer to the Middle Ages and to what is sometimes called the Golden Age of Kiev, meaning the time. Olga? Where's Olga? That crazy B word of the Kievan Rus. The Kievan Rus was a loose federation of East Slavic, Baltic, and Finnic peoples in Eastern and Northern Europe from the Should. 9th to the 13th century and under the reign of the Rurik dynasty founded by the Varangian prince 
Rurik. The capital of this federation was Kiev, and it was, for most of its existence, the most important city. The golden age of the Kievan Rus began with the reign of Vladimir the Great, who turned Rus towards Byzantine Christianity, an important identity of Ukraine which goes back to this moment, and part of the reason why today much of its population is Christian Orthodox. This federation is also the origin point of Russia, mostly through the Duchy of Muscovy, which took over as the main city after the Mongol invasion temporarily took down the importance of Kiev. So the name Ukraine is older than the name Russia? Is, is, that, is that what I just learned? Kiev. After the full disintegration of the Kievan Rus because of the Mongol invasions, several principalities continued on their own, namely that of Kiev. Something we just mentioned is also key, the Mongol invasion, because the Mongols attacking essentially led to that disintegration of the Kievan Rus, and the Rus lands, then known partially as Ruthenia, were soon conquered by others. Western Ruthenian principalities became incorporated into the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the Polish Kingdom, then into the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Essentially, Ukraine as an autonomous nation did not exist during this period, with its territory being divided among many foreign rulers. Most of the Cossacks most of the West was under the rule of Poland-Lithuania, and Crimea, for instance, was under the rule of the Crimean Khanat, a successor of the Mongolian Golden Horde. It's actually crazy how strong the Crimeans were. They even got up to Moscow and destroyed it one time. But local people didn't particularly like the way they were ruled by the Polish-Lithuanian. First, they forced somewhat of a submissive state for the locals. And second, they just didn't seem to care about the territory. So them. the peasants of the region turned to the Cossacks. The Cossacks were a group of East Slavic Orthodox Christian people who became known as members of democratic, self-governing, semi-military communities originating in the steppes of Eastern Europe. Uh, I wish I could hear his laugh. These particular Cossacks had various origins, but were predominantly made up of those from Eastern Europe. This guy is like the only one who doesn't look happy. Are they, what are they doing? What, are they writing like a love letter to his wife or? Why are they all laughing? They're all laughing hysterically, except this guy. <laughs> Europe. These particular Cossacks had various origins, but were predominantly made up of those who preferred the dangerous freedom of the wild rather than life under the rule of Polish aristocracy. So they're like the 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 Russian cow or Ukrainian cow or the Eastern European version of cowboys aristocrats the name cossack even comes from a turkish word meaning a free man and while the cossacks were initially allies of the polish in wars against the turks and the crimeans they soon became enemies the cossacks did not agree with polish customs or rules and in return for their help they demanded representation in the polish parliament as well as great northern war incoming recognition of the ukrainians orthodox traditions at the time suppressed by poland's roman catholic practices the polish nobles rejected these requests and so by 1648 the cossacks revolted against polish rule led by bodan 30-year war kmelnitsky who was celebrated as the liberator of ukrainian people when he entered Kiev, he founded the Cossack Etmanat, a state which lasted for a short period of time, marking a temporary return of Kievan and Ukrainian sovereignty. But it didn't last long for two reasons. One, the Cossack state was fragile and didn't have enough loyal allies, forcing them to pledge loyalty to the Russian Tsardom in exchange for an alliance. And two, the Ukrainian territory was highly sought after by other powers. And so, a period often known as the Ruin followed. Between 1657 and 1686, a devastating 30-year war among Russia, Poland, the Crimean Khanat, the Ottoman Empire, Sweden. Empire, and Cossacks took place for the control of Ukraine. The Sweden? What about Sweden? Or that's Great Northern War? Treaty of Perpetual Peace between Russia and Poland in 1686 finally ended the war and divided the lands of the Cossack Etmanat between them. I'm sorry. Place for the Russia, Poland, the Crimean Khanat, the Ottoman Empire, and Cossacks took place for the control of Ukraine. The Treaty of Perpetual Peace between Russia and Poland in 1686 finally ended the war and divided the lands of the Cossack Etmanat between them, reducing the portion over which Poland had claimed sovereignty. In fact, that's kind of why would you ever name a treaty perpetual peace? It's just kind of like a non-starter from the beginning it's like no everyone knows that's uh, okay 
Cossack Etmanat between them, reducing the portion over which Poland had claimed sovereignty. In fact, most of Ukraine came under control of the Tsardom. Soon after, Russia took over Poland as well, and so most of modern Ukraine came under their sovereignty. Under the control of the Russian Empire, Ukraine's territorial organization was vastly different. It was included in the governorates of Chernihiv, Kharkiv, Kyiv, Little Russia, and Volyn. Also beginning in the 19th century, there was migration from Ukraine to distant areas of the Russian Empire. According to the 1897 census, there were 223,000 ethnic Ukrainians in Siberia and 102,000 in Central Asia. An additional 1.6 million emigrated to the east in the 10 years after the opening of the Trans-Siberian Railway in 1907. The big thing that the, so it's kind of like a manifest destiny that the U.S. did, like the so I, I'm pretty sure, and let me know if I'm wrong. I always want to preface that with a lot of things I'm about to say that I think might be wrong, but I, I want to say somewhat confidently. So a big reason about around Manifest Destiny, which is the Ameri Americans after gaining independence from the British, you know, in the 1800s to push their population westward, is that, you know, they still had the Spanish, the French, the English on the continent. And so, to, and, and so in order to have, you know, the greatest future claim to these areas that you know are inevitably going to be uh, claimed by one of these powers, it's best to incentivize your population to get out of there and out as many people and as far away to the, all the way to the Pacific coast as possible so that in later years you have the best claim to get the land since, hey, your people already live there. Six, the areas in the Far East with an ethnic population of Ukrainians became known as Green Ukraine. Perhaps simply due to the opportunity to live in other places within the empire, or perhaps a consequence of a conscious effort by the Russians to suppress any national identity movements at the time by Ukrainians by moving them away from the territory. A small part of Ukraine's territory was also under the rule of Austria-Hungary at this time, Galicia, and this led to an interesting event. When World War I began, there were Ukrainians fighting on both sides. Three and a half million fought for the imperial russian there were you these eight these areas like um dalmatia um transylvania galatia bohemia silesia all of these places that i hear all the time in um throughout european hi history you know a lot of battles and everything in 1870 there are all these places that i hear but they're not any of none of them are countries of their own today, and so I I, I want to learn more about the relevance of these areas and why they got their names in the first place. Like Dalmatia was a thing with, all the way back, like in the Roman times, right? Ukrainians fighting on both sides. Three and a half million fought for the Imperial Russian Army, while 250,000 fought for the Austro-Hungarian Army. And while the Entente won against the Central Powers, the two empires that the Ukrainians fought for both lost, as the Russian Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire both collapsed by the True, yeah, because the Russian Revolution. The end of the war. The collapse of these two empires also coincided with the Russian Revolution and Russia's internal conflict between the white Tsarist army and the Bolshevik forces. During this period, a Ukrainian national movement for self-determination emerged, and several Ukrainian states were briefly in existence. The Etmanat made a comeback, the Directorate, the Bolshevik Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, the West Ukrainian People's Republic, and the Utsul Republic. But one had bigger importance Soviet. than all the rest. The internationally recognized recognized Ukraine's People's Republic, the predecessor of modern Ukraine created in 1917. Although the Western People's Republic was also important, so much so that in 1919, a unification act was signed to merge the two new states, which led to an internal conflict inside Ukraine itself. In the meantime, the Second Polish Republic, also created in the aftermath of World War I, was suddenly at war with Ukraine. It seems it was essentially a war over which of the two successor states would get to rule East Galicia. Did in summary, the that. war ended in somewhat of a state and according to the Peace of Riga, Western Ukraine was incorporated into Poland, which in turn recognized the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. Soon after, the Soviets took full control of Ukraine and its incorporation into the USSR was complete. Soviet control began with a lot of issues for Ukraine, namely the consequences of the internal conflict that which in turn recognized the Ukraine of East Galicia. It seems a republic also created in the 
into Poland, took full control of Ukraine and its incorporation into the USSR soon after the Soviets took full So, Ukraine being a country only lasted for two years? Full control of Ukraine and its incorporation into the USSR was complete. Soviet control began with a lot of issues for Ukraine, namely the consequences of the internal conflict that preceded it. But soon after, some positive elements took place. During the 1920s, a process called Karenization took place, an early policy of the Soviet Union for the integration of non-Russian nationalities into the governments of their specific Soviet republics. Social benefits such as universal healthcare, education, and women's rights were also increased. But these positive effects were short-lived, and most were reversed when Joseph Stalin reached power. One of the most negative aspects was the forced industrialization. Seems like whenever communist countries start out, they're well-intentioned and they might work quickly, but the big problem is that, in my opinion, a lot of bad things about capitalism too. I could go on for hours about this subject about communism versus capitalism. Fascinating. But it seems like many communist uprisings, when, especially when successful, are, are well-meaning. Like, they're the ones, you know, saying, you know, it's crap, all of these, you know, look at all these poor people, and then all these rich people. How does that make sense? Let's stop it. That is the uh, children's clip notes version that might be wrong, right? <laughs> So uh, take it with a pinch of salt. But they're always well-intentioned, but you set up a, a, a... First of all, you don't set up a, a... You set up a government structure that needs a lot of top-down policies to implement this stuff. But then all you need is one crazy guy to come around, and then you've set up the perfect thing for him to do whatever he wants. First, when Joseph Stalin reached power, one of the most negative aspects was the forced industrialization of the territory. The collectivization of agriculture caused great damage to the peasant population, and while industrial output almost quadrupled, agricultural productivity dropped. Unrealistic quote. It's like, yeah. It's like, oh my god, yeah. Sorry, you can fast forward. I'm gonna talk though. Um, finally, you know, we're gonna get our fair share and everything. And then it's like, wait. Why are you forcing us? Well, it's for the greater good of the next generation. And so, like, you never see your own benefit. I, were I, set I, I'll stop talking. In order to receive grain from the state, and this caused millions to face famine. And then, as if all previous conflicts had not been enough for Ukraine and its European neighbors, another one arrived. Oddly, World War II began with Ukraine being fully united for the first time in its history, as with the partition of Poland between Germany and the Soviets, Galicia and Volhynia were given to the Ukrainian People's Republic, although always under Russian rule. But war brings nothing but loss in the long term. In fact, Ukraine was the main battlefield of the Eastern Front and a war between the Axis and the Soviet Union. The losses of the Ukrainian people in the war are said to to around 40% of the total losses of the USSR, and Victory Day is still celebrated as one of the 10 main Ukrainian holidays. The post-war was again terrible, from destroyed infrastructure to once again facing famine and also forced deportations, and the tension between Soviet rule and Ukraine was only inverted when Stalin passed away, being succeeded- Wasn't he not that- I mean, compared to Stalin, I guess anyone is not that bad, but didn't both- Mao's predecessor and Stalin's predecessor sort of were like, that guy was sort of crazy, right? by Nikita Khrushchev as leader of the USSR. He was said to be familiar with the Republic. After taking power, he began to emphasize the friendship between the Ukrainian and Russian nations. And in 1954, the 300th anniversary of the Treaty of Pereyaslav was widely celebrated Pereyaslav. with the transfer of Crimea to the Ukraine People's Republic. Ukraine then bounced back and arose from its troubles, taking a central stage in the USSR, even supplying it with one of its leaders, Khrushchev's successor, Leonid Brezhnev, a Ukrainian. Upon further research, it seems Brezhnev's Ukrainian nationality is somewhat of a topic of discu discussion considered unclear by some. Okay. Another event that marked this post-war period before independence was the tragic incident at the Chernobyl nuclear plant. 
And finally, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, Ukraine finally regained its independence. In January of 1990, over 300,000 Ukrainians organized a human chain for Ukrainian independence between Kyiv and Lviv in memory of the 1919 unification of the Ukrainian People's Republic and the West Ukrainian National Republic. And in 1991, they adopted the Act of Independence, becoming a fully sovereign democracy, paving the way for the modern Ukraine we know today. So, that is a brief history of Ukraine, short in many aspects, I'm sure. Each of these time periods is full of several other details that are very important and even decisive to understand the Ukrainian people, their nation, and its history. But the purpose of this video isn't to make anyone an expert on Ukraine. It couldn't be, as I myself am not one. It is simply to provide a brief and general overview of this country's history throughout time. And I think that we were able to do. Not get. I think these these channels and he acknowledged it right there you know that's not the most in-depth i think they are just as important as the in-depth ones because it is extremely daunting and intimidating to get into a more thorough view of a subject like this before you know really a lot about it and so i like going into the history matters the nolegias the general histories um that give you a quick kind of overview so uh maybe you can find something you're a little more interested in. Like it always serves to have a, a, an adjacent tangential kind of anchor to set down before you start learning about a Pacific, uh, a Pacific area, an Atlantic area, a specific area in a specific time. Awesome video. Thank you for making general knowledge. Awesome channel. I hope you are all doing well Can teach me some stuff in the comments. I think I probably made a lot of stupid, you know what's strange? And now I'm gonna just have to make dumb comments all the time. The the more stupid comments I make in a video, the more people then comment in the comment section. All right, I hope you're all doing well. If not, chin up. Love you guys. You'll be good soon. Trust me. Look at me. Look, look. You'll be okay soon. If you're doing okay, then hopefully you stay that way. Bye, guys.